I will now present you a patient who is 43 years old and who had the diagnosis of hyperiosinophilic syndrome and endomyocardial fibrosis. The diagnosis was made approximately 12 years ago when the patient developed kidney stones and a further workup was performed, which also led to an echocardiogram and in which the typical findings of endomyocardial fibrosis were found. Let's first look at the peristernal long axis view and let's look at the mitral valve and the subvalvular apparatus. And we can clearly see that we have thickening of the mitral valve the subvalvular apparatus, and also the posterior mitral valve leaflet, which shows some degree of restrictive motion. Left ventricular function is normal, the aortic valve is normal, and the left atrium appears to be of normal size. Very good systolic function. We calculated a fractional shortening in the range of 35%. And here we again see the thickening of the subvalvular apparatus. The real typical findings in these patients, however, are only seen if we look at the apical views. So this is an apical four chamber view, and immediately we see that there is a pathology here at the apex, very echogenic endocardium with an infiltrate, which is very typical of hyper eosinophilic syndrome endomyocardial fibrosis. The differential diagnosis to a thrombus um, must be made. However, there are no regional wall motion abnormalities. Thus, a thrombus, a classic thrombus, is highly unlikely. In addition, we have the laboratory findings of hyper um, eosinophilic syndrome. Um, what is very important in this patient is also to assess diastolic function because many of these patients have myocardial involvement and develop diastolic or systolic dysfunction. If we look at the diastolic function in this patient, I will do that maybe from the stored images, we can see that the patient has an E wave which is taller than the A wave, where the question arises, does the patient have normal diastolic function or pseudonormal function? We can look at the maximum velocity, which is one meters per second, and then also perform a tissue Doppler spectrum across the annulus of the annulus, and then we can measure E prime, and we will then calculate an E to E ratio of 13, which means the patient has at least mildly elevated left atrial filling pressures, which is indicative of pseudonormal pattern and not of normal pattern. So. In summary, uh, the patient does have diastolic function, which is mild to moderate maybe, but good systolic function. Um, I will now also like to show you the mitral valve because the problem the patient had several years ago was that he developed significant high-grade mitral regurgitation and was symptomatic. And let's look at the mitral regurgitation now. You see we have restricted motion of the left atrium, and we can see the mitral regurgitation jet, which is solely located actually in the region of the commissure, and which definitely does not appear to severe, be severe, at most maybe mild to moderate. We can look at that at the apical views as well. I have to move the transducer more immediately because we have shadow of the mitral valve and we will thus not get good quality of the jet. But again, we see that the regurgitant is not significant. It's maybe mild to moderate. Well, the reason is that the patient received treatment uh, initially with cortisone, later on with interferon, and finally with Gleevec. And under this medication, mitral regurgitation actually improved significantly. And the patient also improved with respect to symptoms. So in conclusion, this is a patient who has been well treated with endomyocardial fibrosis due to hyper syndrome uh, and who has mild to moderate diastolic dysfunction and maybe mild to moderate mitral regurgitation.